and we're live okay right amanda let me just have before we start to chit chat away let me have a check that i am actually live and they can see our glorious faces in all the places that it's scheduled to be and i can we're live perfect all right so firstly i always do this just because sometimes i forget otherwise okay so i'll start by saying thank you very much for doing this i uh, i do appreciate your time and we're here with amanda stern and we're going to be discussing all about how good things come to those who journal so amanda do you want to um because i'll probably balls it up if i'm honest <laughs> introducing you so do you want to introduce yourself and what it is you do with journaling how you help people with journaling sure so my name is amanda stern and I have been a journaler since I was an angsty teenager. Um, it was something that I've always done to one degree or another um, my entire life. And it's fairly recently, you know, this past year that I started showing up on LinkedIn and writing about journaling, mostly just to have something to write about. Um, but I was so surprised and warmed by how well it was received and how it resonated with people and how quickly it it was was clear there was a need here. So I love helping people start journaling. I love helping people journal better. I'm a firm believer that good things come to those who journal, that journaling is more than we think it is. It's flexible, it's exciting, it's really fun, and it can help us really in any area of our lives. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so there's a few things there <laughs> to unpack, isn't there? A few things to, to explore and dive into. So this is going to make for what I foresee as quite an exciting conversation. So can we start, please, Amanda, yeah. at what was it that resulted in you starting to journal yourself? Yeah, so I have really four big journaling moments in my life. Um, the okay. first one came when I was a teenager. I was a run-of-the-mill angsty teenager having a bad okay. day. I just needed okay. to talk about it, and none of my friends were available to come to the phone. So I did what I could do, which was grab a notebook, grab a pencil, and start writing. And it was nothing right. fancy. It was not, I'm sure it was not even good writing. I might not even have been legible writing. But I remember writing for a really long time. And I remember when I was done feeling better, that okay. I connected that writing made me feel a certain way, that I was able to let go of all the things that I was worrying about and just be able to put it aside and get a little perspective. Okay. Um, so journaling was something I picked up the next night and the next night. And before I knew it, I had this journaling habit that really served me well in lots of times when I needed it. I will tell you the um, most significant moment came about seven or eight years ago when I was faced with a divorce I didn't want and I didn't see coming. And I knew if I was not careful, I would end up in a not very good place. So I forced myself to grab my journal and to write what I was grateful for. And I will tell you, it was very hard because I wasn't grateful for much. But I, the more I thought, the more things I was able to come up with. And I came up with eight things. And I thought, if I can be grateful for eight things on the hardest day of my life, it's A, a pretty good life that I lead. And B, yeah. it really helped me get some perspective that... What I focus on is exactly what I'll see in my life. And it really showed me I can reach out and seek and grab hold of every good thing that comes my way. And doing so really has made my life better. So I would mm. say grat uh, journaling and gratitude journaling in particular in that instance really changed the trajectory of my life. Can I ask you a question based on what you just shared there? Yeah. You said that you knew that you were you would potentially go into a, a bad place okay so my curiosity is how did you know you would go into a bad place um i knew based on 
based on patterns. Um, it's funny, right. people who have met me in the last seven, eight, 10 years even, will tell you I'm an upbeat, positive person. If you okay. had met me 15, 20 years ago, you might have thought I erred on the side of negative. So I knew that about myself. I knew okay. that if there was an easy way to think negatively, then I would. That I had right. to always be conscious to make sure I um, looked for the positive and really kept some perspective. Um, so part of it was knowing myself, which came from journaling. Came from yeah. journaling. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Okay, so your um, your recognition of a previous pattern gave rise to then trying to almost not go there again. Yeah, it was a combination of that and having a very good imagination that I could <laughs> imagine that going through a divorce would be really hard. Guess what? It is really hard, but it's even <laughs> harder, I imagine, yeah. if you don't. It would have been harder for me had I not made it a point to seek out and grab hold of every good thing I could find. That if I dwelled on what I didn't have, that would be all I saw. When I focused on what I did have and what good could come to me, that's exactly what I saw. Yeah, there's something quite beautiful about what you just said there for me, which is shit happens, you know, and, and we can't deny it, but we can definitely integrate tools that help us to wade through it with a little bit more grace. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. So you mentioned four times, okay? You've, you've yeah. covered the first one, which was teenage years. Can I ask you a little bit about what was... Yeah. What, what made you... I understand, you know, being a teenager, you've got the hormones, like who the hell am I in the world? Um, but was there anything specific for you that triggered that reaching to a journal? Um, you know what? I've been thinking and thinking, and I, I remember the feeling. I don't remember the circumstances. Um, right. I, just, I just know I was your run-of-the-mill, overachieving, anxious teenager. I had a sister who was an anxious overachiever. I had to keep pace with her. I learned very early that I found value and worth in the hustle and in achievement. And I was always seeking to go from um, learning and growth and achievement to more achievement to more achievement um, faster and better, even when I was 13, 14, 15. Yeah. And has journaling given space to understand what was driving that? Um, I will say journaling and a really good therapist um, were both <laughs> really, really helpful. Um, yeah. you know, what I love about journaling is getting my thoughts out of my brain and onto the page provides a, just enough distance to get some perspective so that I can see what's going on. Because sometimes I think yeah. I'm worried about something, you know, and I think it's, you know, thing A, but then I, as I dig deeper, I realize, oh, it's not this that I'm worried about. It's this thing that's hiding underneath that I couldn't see because all of this was loud and busy. Yeah. So it sounds like journaling enables you to have almost a bird's eye view of your own thought processes. Yeah, yeah that is exactly yeah. it. And again, it's not a lot of distance you know, from my brain to my page, yeah. I mean, it might be a foot or two, depending on where I put my notebook, but it's, it's all the space that I need to see what's really going on. Yeah. So although it's not a huge amount of space, it's definitely enough to lend itself to having a little bit of insight. Yeah. I can see how that could be powerful for, for a lot of people. Okay. So we've covered the first two. Okay. We've got Amanda with teenage angst reaches to her journal start was that the first time would you say Amanda that you allowed real authentic expression I think so I mean I was always a kid who liked to write I was that kid in school who's the teacher's dream who said write you know why don't you write a story and so I would write a story and I think I reached for journaling easily because of that because when I was in um, in ninth grade, I had a teacher who taught us the value of writing. Every night it was, here's your assignment, write, write an essay on this thing. And it could be anything from, you know, who are you? 
to um, what do you think about this uh, poem we read in class, to what do you think about this event that's going on in the world? So I had some practice in um, putting my thoughts on paper, but it was really only when I felt like I didn't know what else to do and there was nobody around that I could talk to that I discovered I could write my feelings out and write my thoughts out. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I feel like I got no, lost. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to formulate my own way of sort of expressing this and it's almost, <clears throat> you were taught how to write a story, but when you started to journal, you actually got to experience the story that you're sort of telling yourself a little bit. Yeah, which sometimes people don't realize that, particularly if they haven't got people around them that actually ask questions or give feedback. And, you know, they're, they're not experiencing that. We, we don't really have that, that mirror, do we? So I can see how a journal could be very powerful to really start to, for you to just see, oh, I can't believe I think that. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. it was. So we've covered two two periods of Amanda Stern's life. Okay. Yeah. Um, for anyone that jumps on live, if any of this resonates with you, please let us know. And if you have any questions, again, please let us know. It'd be good to um, have a little bit of a Q and A with Amanda Stern. So third one. If you tell us what about the third one, then. Yeah. So the third one came December of 2020. Okay. Um. So for years. I remembered this thought that my high school English teacher put in my head. And he said, journaling is great. I journal in the morning and that helps me be more creative and more intentional about my day. And I remember as a 16 year old kid thinking how in the world would I ever find time to journal in the morning? I get up, I get ready and then I'm off to school and I'm go, go, go. And then I became a busy mom of little children. And then I became a busy mom of bigger children. And I, okay. for years, it had been in my head, I need to find a way to journal in the morning because there might be something there. So December of 2020 was my moment. My kids were doing school remotely, so I didn't have the rush of getting them out the door. And I had just a little pocket of time. I had put my Christmas tree up and I thought, I'm going to wake up just a few minutes early go sit in front of the Christmas tree and I'm gonna just journal there. And the difference that it made moving from evening journaling to morning journaling, I will tell you, I did not see coming. Um, my evening journaling tends to be more reflective, a little more historical. This is what my day was like. Here's what I'm grateful mm. for. Here's what I learned. My morning journaling is much more actionable. It's what do I want to accomplish? How do I want to show up? What do I what do I need to be able to show up the way I want to show up? And okay. I didn't see that coming. So that helped me really be intentional about setting goals for the year. I set a word of the year. I set goals that integrated with my word of the year. And then I was able to institute some accountability journaling to really honor the process that I had gone through to set those goals. So once a week I sit down and I reflect in my journal about my goals and I go by through them one by one and I record all of my progress, however small. And as a high achieving go-getter, I always make these big goals and here's what I want to reach and here's what I expect I'm going to accomplish. So I don't take the time to recognize these little baby steps that help me get where I need to go. Okay. But slowing down and recording the process on a weekly basis really helped me come to acknowledge this little thing I did was important. This little thing got me from here to here and it's worth celebrating. So just a little at a time, I managed to accomplish way more last year than I had dreamed was possible. I mean, I sat down at the end of the year and made my short list and was surprised to see how much was on there. And I thought if this was a list that somebody else gave me, I would think they were absolutely amazing because that's a lot of really great stuff in here. And then I thought, oh, but that's me. I'm kind of amazing. I did all of that. And it didn't feel hard step by step because I was only allowing myself to really 
do little bits at a time. And journaling really helped me slow down and be able to enjoy the process. It sounds like it enabled you to actually acknowledge your wins, if we could use that terminology. Um, historically, would you have not done that? Oh, absolutely not. Okay. I would have said, oh, you know, that thing I did, yeah, well, you know, it's expected behavior, or it's easy, or anybody could do it. But just recognizing, uh, no, I did it, and it's important. Um, journaling really helped me to capture all of those. And I will tell you, my confidence grew in leaps and bounds somewhere in this process when I wasn't expecting it. Um, I just really stepped into power and confidence that I really had always wanted and didn't know I was capable of. It sounds like you finally had access to a degree of your own approval. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it came yeah. one word at a time. Every morning showing up, even yeah. on the sticky days where the words don't seem to flow and I have to pull anything out of my brain just to fill a couple of sentences on the page, that showing up and putting in the work yielded really big results for me. Yeah. So Sharon Griffith says, dream capture, do you do, do you do this? I'm afraid I don't actually know what that is. Any idea no. what that is? Dream no. catcher, do you mean um, like recording my dreams in my journal? And then she's also in no judgment, grace and acceptance with intentional, meaningful, fulfilling and purposeful action. Okay, yeah. thanks for that. <laughs> cool. So if we go back to... Um, you mentioned that sort of being able to go back and see what you'd actually achieved gave rise to you kind of almost finally being able to give yourself that pat on the back of well done, Amanda. What had denied you that previously? I think I wasn't allowing myself to recognize all that I was doing. I think okay. I discounted a lot really as expected behavior. So I have a background as a school librarian working with special education students, and we use the term expected behavior a lot, right? So right. in my house, expected behavior looks like being where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do. Most, I feel like most of the things on my list could all be grouped under expected behavior. You know, Amanda expects that she's going to do this, therefore it is expected behavior. Um, so, yeah, I think I just wasn't thinking the small things mattered as much as they did. Okay. But they do. The small yeah. things matter yeah. as much as the big things because yeah. it's the small things that get us to the big things. For sure. And those small things, in my experience, often lurk in the background as a small part of ourselves that isn't being... Uh, isn't being acknowledged. Yeah, expected isn't a positive use of words. Do you agree with that? I think it depends on the context. Yeah. Um, like so many things. Yeah, I, I've learned, I learned so much last year. It's funny because my word of the year was grow. And I picked it because I was going to do this gardening program, which I did, and it was great. And I thought it was cute because, oh, I'm going to be growing things. My word of the year will be grow. But when I set my goals, they were how to grow. I realized they were all tied to that. So I grew um, physically and I grew mentally and I grew in different areas and components of my life. So one of the big things I learned was to focus where I have control and detach myself from outcomes and give up expectations, especially where other people are involved. That's a big one, isn't it? To yes. not be attached to outcome. Did that give rise to enjoying the process more? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I had, um, I spent five months on this big, this big effort to get a, uh, a substantial position at work. Um, it was five months in the process. It involved getting a certification. It involved team building. It involved a lot of different components. And in the end, because it was somebody else's decision, I didn't get that. 
And if I had been attached to that outcome being the only possible outcome, I would have been really, really disappointed. But I learned that the journey is where, the journey is what matters sometimes more than where we end up. And that if I let myself enjoy the journey, I end up somewhere that is much better than I could have expected I'd go. Yeah, there's also something very poignant in that, isn't there? Um, I had a conversation yesterday on a call where a lady was telling me uh, about the what if game. Mm. How commonly we can be playing the either the what if game or the if and when game, <laughs> which is when this happens, if this happens. And it's almost like we've hung our whole sense of accomplishment on a set of circumstances looking a certain way. Uh, and then we, we miss the journey and we don't enjoy the process at all. And then if we don't get there, that becomes a reason to give ourselves a kind of a, a slap backside almost. Well, so I Sharon has been going crazy on here. EA can be very, you live in along now. Seems like she is giving lots of advice in the background. <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> All right. So we've covered three cases, I think, so far, haven't we? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I was going to say the fourth one is um, last year when I started writing about journaling on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, it had never occurred to me that something I've always just done would be so meaningful to so many people. Because um, again, I've spent so much of my life in a book. Was that quite cathartic for you oh, to yeah, realize that something that you were very passionate about and that historically you'd kept quite personal was actually wanted by so many people? Yes. And um, it was interesting because I've always thought what I what comes easily to me maybe doesn't count as much as what I have to work really hard for. Um, okay, and I that's see this quite a big one. Yeah. And I it? see this with a lot yeah. of women I know, women in particular, people in general, but women in particular, that when I ask them, well, what are you really good at? You know, we're like, well, you know, I'm really good at baking, but lots of people can bake. So that's really not special. No, but it is special. You know, I'm really good at listening, but a lot yeah. everybody can listen. But no, not everybody really listens, you know. So journaling for me was one of those things. Well, I just, I figured out how to journal as an angsty teenager. So clearly everybody must know how to journal. And that's not the case. And the more people I talk to, the more I realize, I think we have this really narrow definition of what journaling is. We think journaling should look like this. And if you are somebody who that works for, Great. You love to journal. Fabulous. But if you are somebody who that doesn't work for, you might think, oh, well, I can't journal or journaling isn't for me or, oh, that's not going to work. That's not going to help. But if we open kind of open and widen the lens of what journaling can be, I think that's when it gets really fun, you know, to show people that there's no wrong way to journal. And there's no one size fits all way that's going to work for all of us. That how I journal may look completely different than how you journal, but you're mm -hmm. going to get what you need from it. I'm going to get what I'm going to need from it. And the best part is we'll never know because it's not like we walk around comparing notes in our journals, right? <laughs> so I think that has been really the greatest gift and opportunity in my life to discover not only this passion for sharing journaling with people that I didn't realize I had, but how I can make other people, how we can help other people gain the confidence they need to start journaling and to start journaling better, to find new ways to journal that bring new benefits into their lives. Because I'm convinced there isn't an area of my life that journaling can't help with if I'm intentional about how I journal. Hmm. Have you noticed your use of language change over time through journaling? Hmm. I will tell you, I write how I speak. Um, the reason I ask that is my experience, Amanda, has been that so much of the words we use reflect a lot of our thought processes. And so through having that bird's eye view of the language we use, my sense of it is that would give rise to starting to see 
certain certain patterns and how certain words are having a certain impact and then potentially using that as a tool to start to just change the language that we're using a little. Yeah, I will tell you, I have a better feelings vocabulary than I used to have. Uh, that... yeah, did you mention about that about a book about that, didn't you? What was yeah. the name of that book? Because I think yeah, that'd be useful I've, for people. I've been reading Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. That's the one, yeah, Brene she's Brown. She's fabulous. If anybody hasn't read it, you absolutely should. I'm working my way through it. But she describes 87 different feelings and how they're how they're related and how they're different from each other. Um, I also yeah. find- um, That's a big this is party, a, isn't it? Yeah. That's a big party going on within us all. Yeah, the so this is a, a feelings wheel I pulled. I use okay. this, um, I pulled it one day to help- in the middle, were they the six main ones? And then yeah. it stands off of that? Fearful, okay. angry, disgusted, sad, happy, surprised, bad. There might be seven. Um, what, so the, the middle ones, <laughs> they're the main ones. <laughs> yeah, the main ones, and then all the nuanced ones. Oh, this is right. my image is backwards. I'm having a hard time following where I am. But I pulled it one day to um, to help me in a conversation with a teenager. Emotion. What's that? I'm just sorry, I know I interrupted you there, but this was just because those seven emotions in the middle, they were quite, I mean, of course. I tend to take the stance. There's no negative emotions. There's just a bad relationship with them. However, those words in the middle would, there's an assumption here, I'm guessing be characterized as quite negative emotions that are in the middle there. Well, I think they are just the ones, the big ones that we are more likely to know, right? Okay, because gotcha. we can say, oh, I, I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel bad. I'm angry. Right, surprised and disgusted are in there too. But there's a difference between um, I'm sad and I'm lonely, or I'm sad and insig feel insignificant, or mm. I'm sad and I'm hurt, right? So all of these are a little different. So the, the more, the further you go out in the feelings wheel, the more nuance they get. So I feel like I've had a much, a much deeper vocabulary for how I feel which helps me, I mean, it helps me in every area of life, but it really helps me show up as a better parent, a better wife, a better friend, a better sister, daughter, all of it, because I'm less afraid to talk about how I feel because I have lots of practice writing about mm. how I feel. And that Can you might speak be in the same way you would write it as well. Yeah. You do. I do. Okay. Do, I do. And how do people, because how we communicate feelings. I don't know if you've experienced this, but it's quite common to blame other people for our feelings, to use language of blaming other people for our feelings and to almost disown them a little bit. When we bring what we write on paper into communication, when the feelings are actually there, my experience has been that's a very different arena. So how, how have you found bringing the written word into here and now communication with another when there's, you know, emotive charges there? Yeah. Um, so in my journaling, as I talk about how I feel, I like to also make it very actionable. I feel like this. So what can I do about it? Especially if I don't like the way I feel right? I'm feeling insignificant. Well, why am I feeling insignificant? And what do I need to change? What can I do to put myself in a place where I no longer feel like that? And sometimes it's a matter of, I just need to have a conversation with somebody. Mm. You know, I, I said to my husband the other day, um, was a few weeks ago, we were in the kitchen. I said, I'm feeling very small today, which meant mm. insignificant. And here's why I'm feeling insignificant. And here's what I think I can do to change how I feel. And here's what I need from you. It makes me better able to ask for support. That's what it does for me. Okay. Yeah. It, because I, the more I know how I feel, the easier it is to identify what I need. And one of my big lessons that I learned last year is not just that I can ask that I should, that I should take help but I can ask for help that I need and I can ask, also ask for the help that I want. That was a huge revelation to me that people yeah. aren't mind readers. And if I put it out there in the world, 
or to my special people, then they know how they can help. Yeah, that's um, that's huge. I would say actually, if if we're not aware of our own needs, we cannot ask another to meet that need, and we can also not um, feel that almost we don't have that that we don't deserve that need to be met. So there's so much within what you just said there because it takes vulnerability to ask someone to meet a need because I think anyone who's got some level of awareness must recognize it's not someone else's job unless of course certain relationships do have agreements that okay we will meet these needs for one another but there are so many needs we have that we have to learn how to better meet ourselves because otherwise it then becomes a lot of pressure to put on another, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot in that. So one thing I wanted to ask you, um, have we covered the last one now mm -hmm. before I ask you this question? Yep. We have. So we've got the four stages of Amanda Stern's uh, journaling evolution. Yeah, we covered them. Okay, perfect. So... One thing I wanted to ask, it sounds like journaling more perhaps than anything else. Now, there's two big things, but the first one I'll stick with is that it's a superb tool for reflection. Okay. Now, one of the things I've noticed with reflection is people often reflect from a particular position. Mm. Okay. So have you ever heard the term the hindsight is 2020, right? Yeah. we've all heard that now often when we're reflecting we can be looking back on what we could do differently what we could do better what wasn't good enough what we would change all that stuff so even in our looking back we're looking from a view of well this wasn't good enough this was wrong have you not started to notice the pattern from which you reflect upon and start to then kind of question that as well I've been able to change my patterns because ah. I have a, his, a record, a written record of yeah. times when I have faced challenges and overcome them. So okay. I find that my story is not a story of all, all the ways I could have been better. Mm -hmm. My story is a story of how I faced a struggle, how I overcame that struggle. And now, oh, I'm in a struggle today or tomorrow. I know I can look back and learn from past me on how I can overcome this struggle too and have the confidence because of all that I've done that I've recorded in my journal, right? I have proof that I have gotten out of jams. I have overcome obstacles. I have done things that I didn't think were possible for me to do. And so I can do this next challenge too. Nice. Would you be willing to share a kind of personal example just to make it a bit more tangible as to you know a specific situation that's been tough yeah. um, but journaling has helped you to make it through that with more ease yeah um so i worked really hard last year to shoot for a job that i didn't get and okay. once upon a time that would have crushed me but i made it through a divorce, a really kind of messy, messy divorce. And I was a single mom for a bunch of years and I'm a really good mom. And I face lots of challenges with my kids and one by one, we've worked through them all. And if I can do those things, I mean, big deal. I didn't get a job, big deal. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think there's something some really personal. beautiful in what you're saying. I. I think it's very easy to fall into a pattern of doubting our own abilities to overcome things that are in front of us. But the recognition of how we've done it before can lend itself to being, oh, no, I can, I've got this, I can do this. Yes, yeah, well, so I can see and, the power in it. And our, member, our memories are really short. That it's easy to forget even these big things that we never think we'll forget. I think of my mom telling me when my children were little, write everything down because you're not going to remember. And I thought, I've got a great memory. I'm going to, how could I forget this cute, cute, funny, adorable thing my little person did? And I will tell you, my biggest regret is that I didn't journal enough when my kids were small. And I've lost so much of the cute, funny, wonderful that they did. Mm. 
So it's, if I don't write things down, it's hard for me to remember the significance and importance to them because I write, when I write down the things that matter, I see how much it matters. Whereas it's easy for the significance to fade if I'm relying on my memory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I suppose an interesting thing is once it's written down, does that lend itself to seeing it from a different perspective? Or once you've written it down, you're like, no, that's exactly how it was. You can be like, oh, that's the mood I was in at the time that I wrote that. You know, I don't often go back and reread my journals. And I have people ask me this all the time. Um, how often do I go back and revisit them? And my answer is usually only when I'm looking for something in particular. You know, okay. how... Um, how did I feel when I went through this thing last time? I would go back and look that, I would look for that journal entry to find out. I do a lot of revisiting my journals when I'm doing an end of the year reflection to see where I was this point last year. Um, so I don't know, I don't think I have a good answer to that question. Um, mm. But I would, I would say I changed my life as I journal, that reflecting on the experiences helps me understand what I like about my behavior and my reactions and what I don't like and how I can do things differently. It's like that saying, right? You do the best you can with what you've got, but when you know better, you do better. I slaughtered that, but you know, journaling helps me know better so I can yeah. do better, so I can be kinder, so I can be more, I can have a better sense of balance and reflection and a better sense of what really is important in my life. Okay. Nice. Okay. So now you help people to get into journaling and you share the, the benefits of journaling and how other people can reap those benefits and start to actually bring them into their lives. So let's say someone is kind of, teetered, I can use that word, teetered on the edges of journaling, tried it for a little bit, put it back down. How, how would you advise someone starts to, to get into journaling as a, as a means to kind of just start to reflect and learn? Yeah, I always start with your end game. What do you want to get out of journaling? How do you want it to help you? Are you looking to keep a record of your life? Are you looking to better understand what you think and how you feel? Do you want to increase your gratitude? Do you want to track your progress to goals, right? So coming up with one main purpose for journaling can yeah. really help you be motivated to get started. I had a conversation yeah. a few weeks ago with a woman who came to me saying, you know, I've, I just, I want my life to be better. You know, she's like, I, I feel like I used to be more positive. The last couple of years have been really hard, which they have, <laughs> they have been really hard. She's like, and I feel like I'm just missing the joy I used to feel. And I told her, I was like, well, if, if you want to be more positive, I mean, what's coming to my mind is gratitude, right? Because what we focus on grows. That's what we see. Um, so have you tried gratitude journaling? And not just making a list of things you're grateful for. That's a really great first start. But if you go beyond that to here's what I'm grateful for, here's why I'm grateful, Here's what my life would be like without it. And what can I do to take my gratitude off the page and into my life? Like, this is the example I always give, like my cell phone, right? I love having, um, I love having a device that helps me do all of the things. And, but primarily I'm grateful for my phone because my phone helps me have really good relationships with people I care about. I can use it to call my mom and text my sister and send pictures and video messages to my best friend who's you know too far away to visit. So these are these are things my phone allows me to do. And without that, it would be significantly harder to maintain those relationships. You know, I would be more limited to physical visits and letters in the mail, right? So to show my gratitude for what this does for me, 
I use it for those purposes. I make sure I call my mom and I text my aunt, not just when it's on her birthday, you know, that I call my sister, that I, you know, take photos and I remember to send them, that that's how I can take my gratitude for this, you know, this device and really be intentional um, and grateful for it. Mm. So it was really interesting to me <clears throat> about what you shared there is, people often reference mobiles as being the the cause of so many issues don't they so to actually see it as well no, no there's a lot of good stuff here i think it just helps to balance out the argument a little bit i suppose where i might differ a little bit let's say on one of the things you've shared about journaling you were mentioning that lady came to you and she was uh, wanting to to make her life a bit better okay i would be more curious as to explore what her views are on how life should be that give rise to the resistance in the first place because i think that can really start to create some some freedom for people but i also recognize that commonly people are uh, very attracted to what is co considered growth which that's a funny word in itself because diseases grow, Ooh. don't they? You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, so what, what are you talking about growth? <laughs> um, but so I think often people are talking about kind of expanding awareness, you know, uh, becoming more aware of, of what's available as opposed to more fixated on certain things. So, yeah, I would have a tendency to go more in that direction, but I can see how much it's almost like a silent therapist. Mm -hmm. isn't it it sounds like it's like a silent therapist for you to because often people in my experience just want to be heard you know, they don't want to be helped you know they don't want someone to tell them what's wrong and what they need to do and and these are the steps you need to take they just want someone to sit with them and go oh actually what i'm experiencing right now is okay i don't have to beat the shit out of myself because i feel this way but often in my experience people aren't able to do that they they hear something from another and they automatically go into fixing mode or rescuing mode well i will tell you what comes to mind is our journals don't have feelings and our journals don't judge which is a reminder that i give people often right mm -hmm. you can write anything you want in your journal your journal isn't going to judge your handwriting or your spelling or your grammar or anything you write i will tell you it's interesting what you said um, and I think that's really important too. I think something that I find really helpful is finding an easy first step into journaling that we want to do what feels good and isn't too hard, especially when we're starting something new. And I think mm. there's a lot of people who ultimately want to get to what you're describing, but that seems really hard. So if we can find yeah. a good entry level step into journaling, right? Yeah. And I love gratitude journaling as this. It's kind of a gateway into all the other kinds of journaling you can do. That once you find what works for you, you can keep that practice and then add more to it. So yeah. you don't have you don't have to always journal the same way. Your journaling practice can grow and evolve as you grow and, and evolve. Um, and that if you don't have to journal any one particular way. If it doesn't sound fun and you don't want to do it, don't do it, right? Yeah. Find another way to get what you need. And I have people ask me all the time, well, what are your thoughts on guided journals, right? Those journals that have the prompts pre-printed on the page. And yeah. I always tell them, you know, there's a lot of really great ones and there's a lot of crummy ones. But the most important thing to do is if you're going to use a guided journal is find one that speaks to you and helps you get to what you want to get. And if you don't like a prompt that's on a page, you can skip it. You can move around in the book. You don't have to do it in chronological order. And it doesn't, unless it's a therapeutically prescribed program, hmm. you can make it your own. And I think that's the joy of journaling for me is that there's no wrong way to do it. There's no one size fits all. And there's so much flexibility and there's so many fun things that we can try and they can all help benefit us in different ways. 
have you ever found there are I'm trying to think of a way to word this certain character types no or certain characteristics that people have that mean journaling is something they just have such a strong resistance to it's never going to work for them i'm just like in my mind i'm thinking okay what if someone finds writing for them is an access to feeling quite ashamed because they struggle with spelling and they don't like seeing their own writing just thinking have you ever found someone like that could use journaling as almost like a way to heal and accept okay this is this is how i present in written word yeah no i hear that a lot i hear a, a lot of i don't like the way my handwriting looks great okay. if you're mo yeah. more motivated to journal by typing cool type it i write my journal by hand because i like it yeah but there's no wrong way to do it if you want to use a digital journaling app cool if you want to just type in word cool if you want to use linkedin or facebook as your journal cool just save a backup so you have it just in case something ever happens um i get a lot of people who said um someone told me that i should be keeping a journal so i feel like i should but i don't really want to right i get a lot of that or i'm not really sure how i get a lot of um a lot of people who hear like in church or you know from a therapist you need to journal but nobody gives them the tools to really help them. They might get a prompt or two. They might get some basic structure like, you know, preserve a record of your life for those who follow after you. Okay, I've <laughs> never heard that. Yeah, no, I totally I heard it. That it as an instruction. Wow. It feels really weighty. It feels really, yeah. that, that feels really intimidating to me. So I want to make journaling as friendly and approachable for people as possible because we all get to where we need to be when we need to be there. You know, we're all on these journeys. So for you, when you think journaling, sounds like you want to jump right into the nitty gritty of here's what I'm feeling and here's why and just kind of doing the nuances of it. And for people um, who aren't comfortable or who haven't had experiences with that, I can see how that would keep people from journaling. Oh, yeah. That's what I think journaling <laughs> yeah, yeah, has yeah. to be, yeah, yeah, right? Course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, um i'm not that interested in the, the the issues that people present and share uh i mean I, I i like to listen and hold space and that kind of thing but i'm more interested in the the more deep-seated belief that gives rise to those ideas in the first place um and i think that because when we can start to get at that stuff, there's a lot more room in my in my experience anyway. Like for example, the you were mentioning at the beginning, you felt that you had to work hard for things. Now I would drill into that and say that on some level, you've learned that you have to earn love. Yeah. 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 So I if we drill into that. That is something that if people can realize, ah okay yeah. and 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 extract themselves from that room that gives space to to a lot more freedom you know no, but i do realize that that as an expression to hear like it, someone being asked do, do you feel you have to earn love that's quite that's not nice <laughs> for yeah. a lot of people so. yeah no that is exactly um exactly where i got through um, and I will tell you that took me a long time and a bunch of therapy. And I discovered it one morning over a breakfast waffle Sunday, um, sitting in a diner, <laughs> totally, totally crying. My friend thought I was a nutcase and I could trace it back to the thing. But it took me a long time to get there and to be ready to acknowledge all the things. So I think for people who feel like, I don't want anyone to feel or to hear, journaling can help you with your feelings and have this big wave of like dread that, oh, I don't want to look there because I'm not ready yet. I don't want mm -hmm. people to feel like that's what journaling has to be because you know what else journaling can look like? Journaling can look like having a book where you keep your favorite family recipes, right? I put my grandma Stern's Christmas donuts on it and then I get to write all of the stories about when I was a kid going there on Christmas morning and all my aunts and uncles and cousins were there and the feeling of warmth and family and love that 
that's encapsulated with this recipe. That's yeah. journaling. Journaling can be, here's a sketch. Um, I'm, I'm on vacation. I see this wonderful thing. I want to preserve that, right? Journaling doesn't have to be in words. I do all my journaling in words because that's how I make the prettiest pictures. But if you're somebody who's visually inclined, cool, draw it, paint it, sketch it, collage yeah. it, whatever you do. Journaling can look like um, letters to yourself, to your future self, to your past self. You know, to have a series of letters in a book that you can go to when you're discouraged, right? Mm -hmm. Or when you're really excited or when you're lonely. To have those, that wisdom that you have left for yourself. Or even you could keep a record of your day one day from wake up to, to bedtime. What is a day in your life like? It'd be really cool to have that to reflect on later. That, you know, when I'm... If I cracked open my books from when I was in college, because I was a really prolific journal keeper in college, I have journal entries that do, that span, here is exactly what I did today. And it brings me right back to the moment. And it reminds me of the people and the places and the nostalgia. And that's really cool and benefits us too, that the more we write, the better we remember the things we write about which is why I always love to focus on the positive because then those are the stories I get to tell, which feel better than let mm. me, let me read about all the terrible things that ever happened to me. I wouldn't ever go back and read that because it'd be a terrible story. Right. Mm. But the story of here's what I faced, here's how I overcame and here's all the fun I had along the way. That sounds like a journal I'd want to go back and reread. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, it also reveals your preference for the emotions that you've learned to be comfortable with. Yeah. So I suppose a more honest account would be to just openly share it all when we put pen to paper. Um, and can yes. I be OK with more of what I write as opposed to just the bits that I'm comfortable reading? Well, yes. And we can explore all of those in our nitty gritty you know, all the nitty gritty feelings and why we feel that way. <laughs> Your accent is so different to my own <laughs> when you say nitty gritty. Can you do it again? <laughs> oh, now I can't say it. Nitty gritty, yeah. right? So the like more we, we can write about all of those things, but then carry forward what we find to be helpful. You know, so so I think of a kind of, I shared an experience a couple of, couple of weeks ago on LinkedIn. Um, my, we have an air purifier in our house. My mother sent it to us when my oldest two had COVID over Christmas. And it has lights on it. It has a blue light when the air is fine. It has a red light when the air is not fine. I walked into the room one day and all of a sudden the light turned red. And I was kind of caught off guard. And I was like, wait, did I make the, <laughs> did I make the air bad in my room? Like what, what is this, right? Which immediately uncovered Clearly, I'm anxious about something. What am I anxious about? And because I have a, because I've journaled so long and I've gotten to know myself so well, it didn't take me very long to uncover, oh, I'm really just worried that I might, you know, this cold I have might not be a cold. It might be COVID and I don't want to make anybody sick, right? That was underneath what looked like I'm offended because the air purifier told me I was making my air dirty. <laughs> right. But it was so much easier to come to that because of my practice working yeah. through how I feel in different situations in my journal. Does that make yeah. sense? It does. Yeah. I mean, I suppose what I hear more than anything else in, in everything that you've shared is that for you, journaling has been a, a powerful tool for, for reflection um, and reflection in my experience by its nature gives rise to insight, you know, uh, and those insights give us tools to to address situations that previously we, we wouldn't have had. So the first step, it sounds like, from what you've said, is you've got to figure out what you want from journaling. Now, that's not a small hurdle for a lot of people, is it? Figure out, right, what do you want? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. So <laughs> I can see how, yeah, that first step is going to be a big one for people, isn't it? So do you spend a bit of time with people trying to understand that for them? 
Yeah. So yeah. I'm still pretty new in my coaching practice. It's weird yeah. to think of myself as a journaling coach because, again, I don't know. It feels weird. I guess I need to journal about this, <laughs> that right? Movement is like you're building, <laughs> waiting for something to come up. <laughs> but it's 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 really more than anything else. It's a privilege to help people understand all the possibilities. Not even all, some good. of the possibilities. Yeah, I don't even think I show them all the possibilities, right? Because I want people to know journaling is fun and it can be fun. And mm -hmm. we can have those days where we sit down and words come to us beautifully. Our thoughts are coherent. We love our handwriting. We fill up pages and pages in our journal. And those days are wonderful and they're beautiful. And then we'll have some days where we feel like it's a slog and we have to work really hard to get how we feel on the page or to remember that thing we wanted to remember. And I, I call them sticky days because it feels like the words and thoughts are just stuck in my brain. I've got to unstick them, right? But when we can slog through those days, that makes the glorious, beautiful days even better. And it's building resilience, it's building perseverance, and it's really helping us develop that habit that we can call on when we need to, when there's the unexpected, you know, when there's the divorce you didn't want and didn't see coming, when you're facing challenges at work or challenges here or there or with whatever, right, that you've built up that habit so you can, you can use journaling, even if that's not how you currently use journaling, right, that you can you can have that habit to call on when you need it. But you can have a lot of fun along the way. Okay, so let's see if we can summarize this into three points, okay? Because uh, I read a book once that said that three, five, or seven, any, any, more, any more than seven, people can't hold it in their head. So th three points. So number one, you've got to be clear on what you want to get from journaling in the first place. And, and that resonates with me because I think without that sort of why behind it, uh, it's very hard to keep going with the with the how part, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so then the, the second part, what would you say? So somebody's clear about why why they're going to journal, okay? They've got the clarity on that. Mm -hmm. Second part, how do they just get into the actual process of it? I would say figure out a way that works for you. Um, okay. You might be somebody who wants prompts, right, and responds very well to... Um, a question, responding to a question in your journal. Um, okay. Or you might be somebody who just wants to free write, right? Sit down yeah. and let all of the loose thoughts in your brain out. That's how I do my journaling. I always start right. with just yeah. getting all the loose thoughts out so that it makes room for the creative thoughts. And it's sort of like clearing the way for all the great things I want to start thinking about just to get them all on the page, right? So write with your other hand. Because that's I... something in um, there's a there's a great book all about recovering your inner child, right? And it has exercises where you write with the other hand. Ooh. Have you ever done? Have you ever done that? Um, not on purpose in, you know? and not very well. I wish I was <laughs> ambidextrous. Um, no, I can see how that would be really beneficial, yeah. right? But I would say step two is definitely um, to find a way into journaling, whatever okay. that looks like. Um, okay. And then I would say um, the third point. Hmm. Let's, no, pack it up let's use point. a LinkedIn point and say hashtag just keep going. That can be the third point if you yeah. want. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to decide if it was going to be um, have fun. It's four points. Sorry. It's oh, uh, going to throw you four. People's heads are going to explode. I, I know. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, but yeah, remembering that journaling can and should be fun. If it's a if it feels painful to you, find a different way to do it because a painful journaling practice is a very short-lived journaling practice. Okay. Um, and then the last one is remember your practice can evolve and grow as you evolve and grow. So keep what works, try new things, keep it fresh, keep it fun. Okay, so I'm going to summarize it thusly, okay? <laughs> so number one, be clear on your why, okay? Number two, find the right way for you find the way that works for you number three have fun in the process four don't be attached to the outcome oh i like it yeah 
You're much more succinct. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm learning, you know, the, the marketing speak. I uh, love it. Make big promises, essentially. <laughs> that's the, that's a, what it seems to be about. Anyway, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure, honor, and privilege. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to come off of live now and then we'll wrap up in the background. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for.